Greetings. Uh, so now that we understand sort of the anatomy of a long bone and just kind of what bones are made up of, um, now we're going to look at how bones develop and change over time. And um, this process is called ossification, the process of bone formation. So quick little question for you. Um, we've already seen that we have living cells inside our body and that our skeleton um, is sort of we sort of remove nutrients from our bones and add them to our bones over time as our body needs it. So it turns out we actually replace about five to 7% of our skeleton every, take a shot, what is it? Year, month, week, day. Every day, five to 7% of your skeleton is different. And again, this is because when your body needs calcium, it takes it off of the bones. And then when you eat, calcium and get calcium in your diet, you add it back onto your bones. So you're continually tearing down and building up your bones. And this has some interesting repercussions for things that we're gonna look at. So first of all, what are the cells involved in this process? Well, the first group of cells are called osteoblasts. Think b -b -b blasts because these are our bone b -b -b builders. These are the cells that actually lay down collagen fibers which are kind of the base of the bone, and then that allows minerals to deposit on them. So the osteoblasts here are sort of adding new bone. They build the bone up. Osteoclasts, k -k -k class, are the bone ch -ch -ch chewers. And now you may be thinking, Mr. Sanger, k class and ch chew are different sounds, but it turns out they both start with a C, so it works. So the osteoclasts, um, their job is to break bone down. They release an acid that dissolves the minerals away, and then they slowly break those collagen fibers down. So the osteoblasts build the bone up, osteoclasts chew it down. Um, when you, you know, drink milk, get some calcium, the osteoblasts use that to build the bones up. When you need calcium in your body, the osteoclasts break the bone down to release the calcium. And then, uh, you know, these two work together to build these the uh, bones up. Don't forget about those osteocytes. Those are the ones we saw in the last screencast. Um, they're the ones uh, that kind of are embedded in the, um, in the compact bone as well. So um, to understand sort of the repercussions of this, I've kind of broken this down into a, a few major bone concepts, just kind of physiological aspects of bone. Um, to, before we get to the first one, I want to show you this sort of tragically sad um, image of a fetal cat. So this is a fetus. It is a, of a cat. And the bone has been stained black. And if you look at maybe just the arms, you'll notice something interesting. Is the entire bone black? And the answer is no. What part of the bone is that? Remember? the diaphysis. So the diaphysis is stained black, um, but then the rest of it isn't. So what is the rest of it made up of? Well, the rest of it is made up of cartilage. So concept one, the fetal skeleton is actually made up of cartilage. We begin our existence with a cartilage skeleton, and then that is slowly converted to bone over time. So um, here's just kind of an image of this. We start with cartilage, and then slowly the diaphysis is converted to bone, and then um, eventually the epiphyses are converted to bone. Along the way, we carve out that medullary cavity. So take a moment and reflect on this question. What type of cell must be building the bone from the cartilage? So as we go from cartilage to bone, which cells are doing that? Osteoblasts. And then who's carving out that medullary cavity um, and the little pores for uh, the spongy bone? Osteoclasts are doing that. So again, those bones are working together to sort of go from this blob of cartilage to this nicely formed long bone. Um, we actually can see evidence of this in infants and uh, you know newborns. You know, here's an adult hand. Here is the hand of an infant, and you can see that you know there isn't as much bone here um form there's still some cartilage in there or the soft spot of a baby you may be familiar with that you're not supposed to poke them in the head Ooh, gosh don't do that uh, because they have this kind of soft spot of cartilage on top and then slowly that's filled in with bone so even after birth these uh these bones are continuing to to, to ossify and develop so this raises then an interesting question um you know 
if if in early childhood, you know, as you kind of go from infant to toddler, the bones are slowly turning to bone, how do you actually get taller then? You know, if, if you got bones as a two-year-old, how do you grow and get taller? Well, concept two is that growth in childhood occurs at what are called the epiphyseal plates. And a more common term for this is growth plates, which you may have heard of. And what I found is a lot of students, they've heard of growth plates, they, they, they know about growth plates, but when you say, well, what is it? They actually have no idea. So let's figure out what the heck is this growth plate thing? So the epiphyseal plate or growth plate is this little band of cartilage in the epiphysis. That is why it's called the epiphyseal plate. It's in the epiphysis of your long bones. And it's just a band of cartilage that is where growth occurs. So cartilage is able to grow and expand. So basically by having this little band there, um, here's an x-ray that shows that. This is an x-ray of a child and it has that little epiphyseal plate. That means that the, um, you know, the, the growth plate can actually expand and then part of it turns to bone, expand, turn to bone, expand, turn to bone. And so this allows for children to grow taller and then continue this process of ossification. Um, uh, so yeah, that's basically what I said. So cells in the cartilage divide and then that expands the growth plate and then the older cells are turned to bone by, um, it's those osteoblasts while newer cells remain cartilage. And so in this way, it's able to grow and expand and get longer. Um, by the end of puberty, which by the way is about the age you guys are now, that cartilage fully ossifies and growth stops. And so here's two images. One is of an adult, one is of a child. And it turns out that this first one is the adult, the second one is a child. So in the child, you can see that band of cartilage in the x-ray. This is, by the way, the kneecap. It's where the upper bone, and uh, it's called the femur, and then your lower bones of the leg, which are the tibia and fibula. You can see that the tibia and femur both have these little bands of cartilage in them. In the adult, they don't. Um, it's fully ossified, it's completely bone. There's a little line there called the epiphyseal line that kind of remains as evidence that this once occurred, but for the most part, that's it. And once that growth plate is fully ossified into bone, growth stops. So for good or ill, sorry shorties, um, your height is, is being locked in right now as we speak by this process. Um, you know, we can actually demonstrate this. Since the growth plates are in the epiphyses, most of the growth actually occurs in the long bone. And so what you can do, and, and in class I would normally do this, is you get a tall person and a short person side by side, and you sort of line their hips up. So, um, you know, if you kind of have that tall person squat lower and lower and lower so that their hips are in line with the short person, what you find is that the torsos are actually pretty close to the same height. Um, what really gives the tall people their height is that their legs are really long and their arms are really long. So again, the growth is happening in those long bones where those epiphyseal plates are. That's where the majority of, of growth happens. Um, so then that raises another interesting question. Well, what happens if you break your growth plate? Here's a fracture right through the growth plate. Um, if this happens in children, what happens? Can they grow there? And the answer is they can't. Um, and that leads to situations like this where one leg could potentially be a lot longer than the other. And that, of course, is extremely problematic. And so when a child breaks the bone, a bone, uh, one of the first things they'll look at is, well, did it injure the growth plate? And if it did, then that requires some additional um, intervention to kind of help, you know, allow the bone to continue growing. I actually had a student who broke his, uh, it was it was his ring finger, I think, uh, when he was in middle school. And um, if he compared his two ring fingers, one was way shorter than the other because of this, which is kind of interesting. Um, concept three then is that bones remodel themselves in response to physical stress. So when you put physical stress on the bones, that actually triggers changes that causes the osteoblasts to build up that part of the bone. And if you don't put much pressure on the bone, then that causes the osteoclast to break that part down. So when that calcium is being added and removed to bone, it's not just all willy nilly, it's kind of in response to the stress you put on bones. And that means that different activities can actually affect bone strength, bone density and strength. So for example, um, if you lift weights, we all know that lifting weights, uh, you know, gives you added 
well, in a lot of people, uh, lifting weights gives uh, added muscle mass. It also turns out that adding uh, lifting weights adds to your bone strength as well, because that stress that you're putting on your bones when you lift the weight is causing uh, the increase in bone density of your bones. Um, swimming, what do you think? Would swimming impact bone density much? Answer is no. It turns out it doesn't. And the reason why is because swimming doesn't put much stress on your bones. You're in the water, you're buoyed up. So while swimming is uh, an excellent exercise for cardiovascular health, your heart and lungs, it's excellent exercise for muscle strength because it uses your muscles, it doesn't actually add much to bone strength because you're just not putting much stress on the bones. This also, by the way, makes swimming a great exercise for someone who's been injured. Because if you have an injury in your bones, then swimming can allow you to work on your cardiovascular and muscular health without putting too much stress on your bones. How about obesity? Turns out obesity does in fact increase bone density um, because of the added weight that the person is carrying around. Um, last one, being in space. So if you're in space, there's pretty much no stress on your bones because there's no gravity. And it turns out this is hugely problematic for humans who've traveled to space. So in the uh, you know 70s, they did these, uh, these missions to the moon and these astronauts would only be in space like a week, 10 days, I think. But when they came back after that just very small amount of time, they, their bone density was so weak that they couldn't even stand up. On, on Earth. And so they'd have to kind of have people come out and like hoist them out of the spaceship as they returned. Uh, this is the little uh, capsule that brings them back to Earth. And so some other people would have to, you know, take a boat out to them and kind of haul them into this boat because they were so weak they could barely move. Um, and then they'd have to use canes and stuff for a while until that bone strength built itself back up again, which it eventually did. Now, this raised the question, well, what about the International Space Station where, where astronauts are up there for like months and even years? Well, part of their daily regimen is they have to do an intense amount of exercise. So they have these devices where they're pushing against, you know, resistant rubber bands and things to increase the, the uh or to yeah, increase the stress on their bones. And by doing that, they do actually manage to keep their bone strength. But this is like hours per day, several times a day. I mean, a huge amount of their day is spent pushing against these resistance exercises to keep their bone strength up. So this is a very uh, dramatic example of how bone density can change based on the environment the bones are in. So here's just a kind of quick written summary of what I just said. Um, and so what we're going to do uh, with the next screencast then is look at problems related to ossification. So now we understand the physiology of how bones work. What happens if we don't take good care of our bones? Dun, dun, dun. Next screencast.